I am Stephen with AlbertaUrbanGarden.ca. Slugs, if left alone in your garden, can do quite a bit of damage to your crops. On this week's installment of the Testing Garden Assumption series, I'm going to evaluate the most commonly recommended ways to manage slugs and tell you how I'm going to manage them into the future. There is a wide variety of critters that fit underneath the term slug. Slugs usually feed on decaying material, however they do feed on live plants, such as my squash, bean, and leafy green seedlings, and in some cases even killing the seedlings within a matter of hours. They can expand to other crops, such as carrots, strawberries, peas, and the cabbage family, if that's the only food source available. Slugs do play an important role in the ecosystem of the garden. However, when their population numbers spike, they can turn into quite the garden pest. Using mulch and making compost in the garden does provide a food source that can allow the populations to boom like they did this year. I, however, will continue to use these methods, as their benefits far outweigh the increase in slug populations. My general philosophy for pest management in the garden is one of ecosystem equilibrium, meaning I've created a nice ecosystem, so predators of slugs also want to live here, keeping them under control. Things like those slug pellets are very effective, however, they may have unintended consequences. If you knock out the entire slug population within your garden, you're knocking out a very important source of food for their predators that can result in the predator population crashing as well. What will happen then is you will see much more frequent increases in the population numbers of slugs because their predators that would normally control them are simply not there anymore. The first consideration for managing any pest is a passive method. As I just mentioned, slug predators usually keep their populations under control. As such, I try to make my garden habitat as nice as I can to support a predator population. I do this by planting a wide variety of crops in a high density, essentially creating a little ecosystem. By planting in a polyculture, I've created a very supportive habitat that can not only support things like slugs, but their predators. And by having this robust population of wildlife within my garden area, it creates a self-regulating ecosystem that reduces the chance that any one pest will be able to spike in population numbers and cause a lot of damage. The second benefit of a polyculture is that pests have a harder time finding the crop that they prefer, and when they do, there's not enough of any crop to feed a subsequent population boom, further compounding the problem. As in nature, from time to time, populations of pests will sometimes spike, and this is when I spring into control. I focus my efforts in on where I see the damage, and the intent is not to wipe them out. The intent is to manage them long enough for the plants to take off, and then for the predators to get them back under control and to re-establish equilibrium within the, the garden habitat. I started with probably the most common advice for managing slugs. I circled the crops that I had seen some damage on with eggshells that were a variety of sizes from powder all the way to large shards. The theory being that it will be difficult for them to move over. Turns out this method did not work well in my garden. In fact, it seemed to have no effect on them other than I was able to see the slugs on the white background a little easier. The next method that I implemented was manually picking the slugs off of my plants and dispatching them. Although the eggshells did not stop the slugs from passing, it did make it easier for me to see them. Manual removal is very effective. However, I'm not in my garden overnight, which is when the slugs are most active. Slugs can do a lot of damage while you're sleeping. They can take a nearly untouched seedling and reduce it to next to nothing overnight. So I needed to add something else to my hand picking in order for me to be able to meet my slug management goals. My next strategy was to use a beer trap. The basic premise is that carbon dioxide being released attracts slugs and they subsequently drown in the trap. You can use beer, however this seems like a waste of good beer, so I used an alternative that I saw on the One Yard Revolution channel. I added a pinch of brewing yeast to one tablespoon of sugar and one tablespoon of flour and mixed it in water. Prior to mixing the bait together, I prepared a container by cutting slots roughly at the same height midway through the container, leaving a good amount of area below to hold the bait. I made sure to use a container that had a lid so that I could keep the rain from filling the bait area. In order to install it, I placed the container in a hole so that the soil level was level with the slits that I had cut into it. Once settled, I poured the bait in and put the lid on. Slugs are more active during the night, so I set the trap up a few hours before dusk to allow the yeast to begin its work. After a few days, the yeast had run out and I overturned the container onto the soil and found that a number of slugs had fallen into the trap and perished. You can simply tip the content of the trap onto the garden as the nutrients and the yeast can easily be returned to the soil. I refilled it and continued to use my beer trap. 
At this point, I had nearly gotten my slug problem under control when Mother Nature stepped in and gave me a hand. I had found a toad that had moved into my garden area and the neighborhood robins have been coming to my garden more often and in larger numbers. Toads and robins use slugs as a food source and can eat quite a few in one sitting. Earlier I had mentioned my garden philosophy about allowing the ecosystem in my garden to self-regulate, and here it was at work. Shortly after the arrival of my toad and the robins in larger numbers, I was able to stop handpicking and the beer traps because Mother Nature had re-established equilibrium and had the problem under control. If Mother Nature had not come to my rescue, I thought, if I needed to add another slug management technique, I had better do some research. Salt is promoted as a method to quickly kill slugs and is in fact very correct. Dousing slugs in salt is an effective way to draw out all the water from their bodies, killing them. The same thing that kills slugs would also kill plants. If salt gets into the rooting zone in high enough concentrations, it will pull the water out of the roots, effectively dehydrating the plant and killing it. And once salt gets into your soil, it's nearly impossible to get rid of, as it does not biodegrade, and if you try to wash it out, you'll likely get rid of all the garden's nutrients before you actually get rid of that salt. For this reason, I will never use salt in my garden. The most common recommendation is to use copper as a means to prevent slugs from reaching your plants. The concept here is that copper provides a barrier for slug movement. If you create an uninterrupted barrier all the way around your plant, the slugs are said not to be able to cross it, preventing the damage in the first place. Researchers at the University of Newcastle in the UK put this to the test and found that copper foil did have an 80% effectiveness rate as a barrier for slug passage. For copper to be an effective slug barrier, it needs to be pure copper and have absolutely no corrosion on it. Copper currency, such as the Canadian penny that was discontinued a few years ago, is not pure copper. And even if you do find pure copper pennies, by their nature of being round, they do not make a very good continuous barrier. So, you can find copper foils and tapes at garden centers. However, to protect all of the plants in my garden, that would likely be a very expensive trip to the garden center. Another method that is promoted as a barrier for slug movement is diatomaceous earth, or DE for short. DE is essentially made up of the broken shells of prehistoric diatoms, or little sea creatures. DE works by aggravating the movement of critters, and is very sharp and cuts them as they move. DE is very good at killing and managing insect pests. However, it's non-targeted, meaning it will attack your garden pests just as much as the beneficial insects in your garden, such as ladybugs or honeybees. DE as a barrier for slugs is much less clear. Studies have shown limited success. However, constant issues with applying and maintaining a barrier have reduced the efficiency of diatomaceous earth for slug passage to near zero. One of the issues with effectively using DE as a barrier for slug passage is the fact that wind and water can move it very quickly, effectively reducing your impermeable barrier within a matter of moments or hours. There are many methods out there that will help you manage slugs in your garden successfully. However, no one method is 100% effective. In my garden, I do prefer to avoid the use of store-bought products, so I rely on the ecosystem itself to self-regulate through the use of predators. When those predators can't keep up and populations of slugs do increase, I'll rely on hand-picking and beer traps to get them under control until the ecosystem can re-establish equilibrium. Things like slug tabs, uh, diatomaceous earth, and other products such as copper are very effective. However, I would like to avoid some of their unintended consequences in my garden. As such, I'll avoid them. If you would like to see if any other products, practices, or methods hold up, check out the link to the Testing Garden Assumption series on screen now, and make sure to subscribe in order to catch all future episodes in this series.